Ted Jones messed with the wrong melon farmers. Ted Jones, I also call him the eighth wonder of the real estate world. Ted Jones, who knows, you know, it could be... Ted Jones? The Ted Jones World Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Ted Jones World Podcast. I am your host, Ted Jones. And today, ladies and gentlemen, we have a lovely guest, Danielle Naftali from the Naftali Group. The Naftali Group is a privately held global real estate development and investment firm based in New York City. Danielle Naftali is the director of marketing and design for Naftali Group. Danielle leads the marketing, creative branding, strategic sales strategy, design, and product development of the group's multi-billion dollar portfolio of trophy properties, including condominiums and multifamily new developments. Throughout her career, Danielle's keen attention to detail and passion for interior design has made her one of the most sought after marketing directors in the industry. So Danielle, how are you? You like that? You like that intro? Pretty clean. Teddy, that was the best intro I've ever had. That was amazing. amazing. Amaz so Danielle, where are you right now with this gorgeous piece of art behind you? Actually, I'm in my office on 57th Street. So we actually just moved into this new office about a year ago and we gutted the entire space. This is actually a piece that I selected um, from this very cool artist, Dan Miller. Um, he actually comes from an organization, which is a really cool story. Um, and it's an organization called Creative Growth. And what they do is they sponsor um, different types of, you know, disabled artists and they have them draw in this really cool warehouse in California. And they really promote these artists. They have Dan Miller actually here at the MoMA. Um, so, you know, it's beautiful piece of art and, you know, it's uh, contributing to something very important. So, you know, we love it, but thank you for noticing it. No, I mean, it's amazing. So Danielle, you with all your interior design and marketing skills, I think you got to let us in, obviously, and we're going to get to that uh, throughout this episode. But I, I want to start off with, I think, um, you know, the article that was in The Real Deal this week. So for those who don't know, The Real Deal is um, a very prominent real estate um, website and magazine, and they have issues in South Florida, LA, Chicago, I believe now, and New York. Yeah. So um, they just have the 411 and gossip of what's going on in New York City real estate. It's kind of like the page six. For yeah, right? It is. The page six of real estate. All the gossip. <laughs> David has a ridiculous Going to gossip comparison. of the real estate world. <laughs> yeah. Sure. So, okay. So you guys partnered up with Jerry Seinfeld to put this enormous um, New York Times article on the front of your building on Madison Avenue. Can you kind of talk a little bit like, talk a little bit about that and what that was like, um, you know, thinking about potentially doing something as creative as that? Yeah, so it's actually a funny story. My dad and I were, you know, brainstorming. We always like to do very creative things on our buildings. Um, but specifically this year when, you know, we were talking, we said, why don't we do something very interesting but also something to contribute to a positive message to New York. Um, you know, and the Jerry Seinfeld article came out, I think it was late summer and we both read it and, you know, really loved the article. And we kept thinking, what can we do to continue promoting this amazing article, you know, which we agreed with the message very much. And, you know, it's, it's, there's so many bad articles about New York right now that it was so, you know, positive to read Jerry's article. Um, so we said, why don't we find a way to promote this article on our building? So at first, you know, when we were talking about it, I kept saying to my dad, I was like, I don't know how to contact Jerry. Like, how, how do I contact him? So I tried for two to three weeks. I was really pushing on the idea. Um, and at the same time, we were looking, you know, with our construction team, how to actually form the right way to put this you know, 60 foot banner on our building. So just, to, sorry, don't mean, to, don't mean to cut you off, but it, it was, it was like the front page um, yes. of the article from the New York Times. That yes. You're putting in your building. Right. Exactly. So, you know, we said, how do we construct this? At the same time, we were starting to actually, and we're starting right now to lay our um, hand lead limestone on the facade. So, you know, working on all those details. Um, meanwhile, doing that, I actually was able to reach Jerry's PR team and they were super um, helpful and loved the idea. And Jerry was, you know, like very happy to have this huge 
banner of himself, you know, on the building to help promote New York. So, you know, we went back for a few weeks. We were able to figure out all the logistics. It went up Friday night and we have gotten an overwhelming amount of, you know, positive feedback, not only from the real deal, also it was on Fox 5 this morning, but more important than any of that, you know, aside from the press, what I've seen is so many people, I've, I've walked past the site a few times these past few days, so many people are stopping to look at it. Are they taking, taking on, pictures too? They're taking pictures, they're putting it on social media. And, you know, we've gotten such a positive support and people are like, this is what we needed, you know? And I think at the end of the day, what my dad and I were thinking is, this is not something where we need to promote our project. It's just, here's a beautiful building that we are building and we have this canvas to work with. Why don't we do something positive for New York? And I think my dad and I are very happy with how it came out. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's the story. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Jerry Seinfeld came out with an article. I don't know, was it like an opinion article in the New York it's Times? Yeah, article. so it was, it was a few months ago and it was titled, So You Think New York Is Dead? And Jerry Seinfeld uh, went through a number of things that, you know, uh, not true New Yorkers were quoting and being like, well, you know, the city's, the city's not going to be back to normal. I'd much rather be in Indiana where I can go out and like the, in the countryside and play with my dog and spend less money. But like, uh, I think people for the most part, at least true New Yorkers, uh, really used this particular time, like these last eight months or so to like, this was their excuse to get out of the city and like move to the suburbs and become more comfortable just because like, I don't know, maybe they couldn't deal with the hustle and bustle of New York. Exactly. New York is not dead, that's for sure. Uh, okay, so where is the actual building? I know it's on Madison Avenue, but where can uh, people walk by and take a look at this enormous front page on the side so of your building? It's on 79th in Madison. It's one block from the park. So if any of you want to walk by, it's amazing. It's going to be up for a few months. Nice. And you definitely can't miss it. You know, it was super funny when I saw the picture of Jerry Seinfeld and your dad. I was like, those dudes look. They're, they look like their best friends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they like, 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 best I think friends. like a full relationship before that. Have, have they met look before? Like, no, they have not met, but they really made it look like they were like laughing at each other. It was, it was great. Okay. Very so, uh, so you have a number of projects that you work on all the time, but you are really focusing on a project right now called the Benson. Can you give us the location, how many apartments, what's, yeah. you know, what the amenities look like? You know, sure. just give us the specifics. Yes. Yeah, so honestly, so the Benson is where the Jerry Seinfeld um, banner is. Oh, okay. That's 79th in Madison. 79th in Madison. It's really, you know, just a spectacular project for us in every way. Um, to me personally, it's been a project, you know, I have put several years into both the pre-development, the design, you know, creative direction and branding. But I think really what is the most important and special part about this project, it's actually the first ground up new development west of Park Avenue in more than 20 years in this part of town. You know, if anyone wanted to buy an apartment up to now, it was either in a co-op, um, a conversion, there was nothing really brand new built from the ground up. So that has been, you know, super special to many buyers. Um, and, and, you know, this building is really, uh, we hired Peter Penorier as the designer um, and the architect for the building. And really the building, as I mentioned before, it's very classical. It has beautiful, large windows, hand, you know, laid Indiana limestone. Um, and it's just a super special building. We're really excited for it to go up. And, you know, the project has been really well received by the marketplace. We've only been on the market for two months since we've launched and we've sold several units, including our penthouse, which, you know, we sold last week for $35 million. Um, this building is, it's really special. It's boutique, which has been honestly a huge component to people buying during this time. So you say boutique, how many apartments is that considered? It's 15 units. Almost oh, wow. all of them are full floor units. So you have private elevator entrance. Many of them actually have private outdoor space. So it's just, you know, and obviously the location is impeccable. I mean, you're one block from the park. The top of the building has Central Park views, which is amazing. Um, so it's a really special building. And, you know, I, I really can't wait for you guys to all see the finished product. It's really a perfect addition to the neighborhood. 
And just a little bit of background, we actually named the building after my grandfather. Um, oh, nice. So, you know, it has a lot of meaning to me. And um, we really put all of our, you know, all of our energy into building this building. And it's, I think it's going to be amazing. And people, especially the neighbors, are going to be very happy when it's done. Yeah, I bet. So uh, you mentioned kind of like the vibe of the building. To, like in all of the buildings that you either like gut renovate or develop, do you guys have like a certain theme that you think about before you just start, you know, going vertical? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So first of all, we spend, and, and it's hard to understand until you're really, you know, behind the scenes, we spend thousands and hundreds of hours, you know, going into designing each and every building that we build. And specifically before we go into the design, we spend a lot of time with, you know, our brokers and our architects and interior design team to really think about the ambiance that we want to build for that specific marketplace and that neighborhood. And it's honestly really the best part about the job. It's really fun. You know, we create and develop and design new buildings that will be part of the skyline for, you know, hopefully ever, but every single one is, you know, unique in its own way. Um, and, you know, th they do all have different vibes and they do have all different ambiances depending on, you know, where the building is located. And again, like I said, it depends on what, you know, the, the demand for that specific market is. And that's, you know, we never design to our personal taste. We design based on what, you know, will best fit to that neighborhood and that marketplace. And that, you know, historically, that's what, you know, we have seen be successful. Do you so, guys have, um, <clears throat> do you guys have like a finish date in mind when you think like everything will be done? Yeah. So we're actually, um, first closing will be Q4 of 21. Obviously, it'll roll out for a few months after that. Um, but that, that's where we're anticipating the first closing. So what else do you guys have in the pipeline? I know this, this is like an enormous project that you're working on, but I, kn I know you guys are all over the place. That's actually our smallest project that we're working on. We are working on a few really, really exciting projects right now at the moment. Two of them are close by to the Benson on the Upper East Side. Um, and then we're working on an additional one that's very, very large, and it's going to be amazing. It's on the waterfront. That's all I can say for now. Nice. You, you, can't, uh, say what, you can't say what borough? I, I cannot say. I, you know, I'm going to go out on a whim. You haven't even told me, and, like, maybe you'd get mad at me if I was spilling the beans, but, like, I'm thinking if it's on the waterfront, I know you guys do some work in Brooklyn. We'll see. I'd say that would be, like, a, maybe, that'd be like a blowout. Huh? Um, but I will tell you, <laughs> you know, that we're really, really busy as a company right now working on the pre-development of all these projects. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, in a good way, a little bit of luck and a little bit of, you know, the team's effort here at Naftali Group of really timing the real estate market in the right way. The Benson is a unique project that, you know, in this market we are seeing is, is selling. Um, but I think it's, it's the right move that we're in this time on all those other projects working on the pre-development and design versus going out to selling them right now. So do you work directly with your father like every day? And how, how is it working in a family business like this enormous? So, you know, working in the family business is, to me, I, I, it depends on the person. I really feel like the luckiest person being able to work in a family business. You know, many second, third generations in family businesses, you know, take these opportunities for granted and totally many times run the business to the ground. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard that by like the, the second generation, it's like almost dead. And then by the third generation, okay. so, it's totally dead. So I, I really am fortunate enough to have my dad, one, as my boss, as my mentor, as my best friend, you know, who really taught me from day one where I actually was the receptionist, which I'll go into in a few minutes, that I have to earn my position at the company. And I've been here for over six years now. And it's what he's always taught me is that, you know, um, your, your, uh, your business is really, it's, it's not a, uh, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And that has really stuck to me since day one. And I've really taken my time to progress in the business and take more and more responsibility slowly as I grow in my, you know, both my knowledge and, you know, just experience. Cause in this business, it's really about experience. And the wonderful thing that I've learned, you know, as a tremendous amount from my dad is that 
is not only about him, it's everyone else in the company. We're a very collaborative group. And I have to say, I've learned so much from everyone else in the business. And, you know, the thing that I really love most about working with my dad is that we both really share a passion, both for this business, real estate, and for design. And I think that that is something that I will always cherish having, you know, his mentorship right now and teaching me everything because he really does have the patience to teach me. Um, but yeah, I feel really fortunate to work in the business. And I know that I'm fortunate to have this, you know, platform to work with. It's just a matter. It's up to me now what I do with that platform. And I think that's all up to me. And, you know, working really hard is so important in a family business in every way. How many people uh, work at Naftali Group, like in the office? So in our main office, we're about 30 people. We like to keep it small, but obviously we have in every construction site, you have about 200 construction workers. We have sales galleries. So there's, you know, a bigger group outside of our 30 um, here in our corporate office. How have you guys been handling uh, the coronavirus situation? So, you know, in the first few months, just like every other company, we were working from home. Um, and then in June, when construction sites were able to reopen, you know, that we reopened those construction sites. But up to now, we're only 25%, you know, at capacity. Um, and, you know, every other day, we're in different group A, group B, you know, people don't feel comfortable coming in, they do work from home. Uh, it's, it's a new adjustment, just like anyone else right now. So you mentioned that you were a receptionist. So is that how you got started uh, at your dad's company? So that's how I got started at Naftali Group. The way I actually got started in the business was I was, I've always been a people's person. I went into my undergrad at Syracuse University as a psychology major. I really wanted to work with people and understand how people think. Um, but then I think it was my, it was my sophomore year. Um, you know, I was looking for an internship, but obviously it's very hard to intern as a therapist. Like that's not an easy internship to get. So my dad said, why don't you just try, you know, for the summer, you're still young work for, I was working for a brokerage firm and, you know, just work on a few rentals. And I've always been a very creative person. So I said, you know what, why not? I'll try it, you know, three, four days a week. Mm -hmm. I ended up being in love with it. We were working on, you know, how to improve the units, which, you know, kind of got my mind thinking about design and, you know, everything. And then I worked for um, Compass, which at the time was Stribling for a few years. And then once I wanted to kind of transition and go into Naftali Group, my dad said, you know, no problem. You can come work for us, but you're going to start from the bottom and you're going to start as a receptionist and you're going to, you know, respect every position at the company. I was answering the phones, shredding paper, mm -hmm. doing all of that. And I think that has really, you know, been part of my character and appreciating every job um, at this company. And uh, it's built me, which is awesome. So how, like, in terms of like buying a building and now um, I'm sure you, if, if you haven't already, you're definitely very close to identifying um, like a plot of land or identifying a building that just fully needs to be gutted or needs to, you need to develop, like what's kind of the thought process in how you'd approach a building that maybe you can gut the whole thing or maybe you'd knock it down and then go higher. What's like, what, what's the starting point, you know? Cause like for the most part, people, when they get into real estate, uh, they look for maybe a, a three unit home, they'll live in one unit and then they'll rent out the other two and then they'll have their mortgage paid for by the other two units, whatever it is. So yeah. how does uh, a person like yourself identify that, okay, this is going, th this we're going to sell $35 million condos in, or this we're going to gut the entire building and add a hundred units. That's a very loaded question. We can be here for a few hours talking about this. So Let's do it. I know. Um, <laughs> obviously, the, the number one most important decision in, in, you know, before seeing if something makes sense is to see if the deal makes financial sense. That's always number one. Honestly, the second thing that's most important aside, you know, from obviously location is, is there high demand in this location of the site? So I'll take the example that you just said of the Benson, right? When we looked at that site and we said, wow, there has not been a ground up. No one has been able to successfully assemble a site um, west of Park Avenue in over 20 years. And by, sorry, Daniel, and by assemble a site, you, you had to, 
you had to buy four buildings, correct? On there the Upper East Side. Four different buildings, four different owners of those buildings. It took us over a year to assemble the site. Um, but it was, you know, when we were very conservative, um, you know, when we underwrite a deal. Um, but there was obviously a very high demand for this marketplace on the Upper East Side to be close to the park. There, you know, to have a new building that's condo, new mechanical systems, you know, high ceilings, amenities, all of those features that people, you know, what we were seeing is there was this transition from all these wealthy buyers on the Upper East Side, you know, migrating to downtown because they did not have the option to buy in a new building on the Upper East Side. And they, that's what they wanted. They wanted a new building and they wanted all these new you know, fancy features, but they couldn't get that in an old co-op. And to be honest, no one wants to buy in a co-op anymore. So we saw this as a huge opportunity um, and even, you know, conversions that were being done nearby were, you know, getting record breaking prices. So, you know, um, I think that the location um, and, and the quality that we're building there and the design and the floor plans and the amenities, all those features, um, that's the, the formula to success. What um, is the first project you worked on and your favorite? Okay. That's like saying, what's your favorite child or who's your favorite child? <laughs> well, I'm um, sure that I only sure have one. Well, I only have one. child is, is usually the favorite, right, Danielle? Right. We both know that. I mean, Henry, my French bulldog, is definitely my favorite. My <laughs> only. Um, but I would say, so the first project I worked on uh, a side, at Naftali Group, where one of our collaborations was 234 East 23rd Street. So that was 50 units on 23rd Street between 2nd and 3rd. That was back in um, 2014, no, 13. I remember, um, seeing, I remember seeing that building going up and seeing like your name plaque on Yeah. Because yeah. like every building that the Naftali's develop, or, or also that you got, I guess, gut rehab. You <laughs> put like a fancy Naftali yeah. group. I was like, oh, is that yeah. Danielle? Sick. Yeah. That, that is me. Um, <laughs> actually, that project was super exciting to me. And honestly, it made me fall in love with real estate because the market was super hot back then. And I was actually an admin at the time. I had just gotten my salesperson's license and we had 12 appointments a day. We sold out the building in six months. And I was like, wow, this is real estate. And we were like sending contracts out every night. It was like crazy. And that was like, that was super fun to me. So that was my first real project, you know, being involved at Naftali Group, um, which was great. My favorite project, I mean, the yes. Benson is definitely okay. one of my favorite. But if you ask me in two years when I have a new project, it might change. Right. Well, what about in the, in the past six years? One of your favorites. You don't have to pick a favorite child. Honestly, the Benson. I think it is, like I said, it is a rare, rare opportunity. And I think that it is really going to be treasured by the entire neighborhood. I think the architecture and the design and just everything about it is just amazing. And I worked uh, for, you know, more than 12 months just on the branding and, you know, my grandpa's name and all of that. So it's super special to me. So that's my favorite. So what, how did your, just quickly, I guess, how did your father get into the industry? I know your dad is like not originally from the United States. Yeah, that's also a really long story, but I'll make it short. Actually, um, he was born in Israel, just like I was. He served in the Israeli army and- IDF. Yes, all the way. Um, and after he served in the IDF, he actually went to USC in California. Um, at the time, he, you know, he was much older than when we were going to college and, you know, he wasn't in a frat or anything like that. He was I, was li I was literally just going to ask. I was like, was yeah, that was a frat bro or what? No, his, his mom was a single mom at the time. She, you know, put in a lot of her money at the time to let him go to school there and he wasn't going to fool around. So when he got there, um, he was studying at USC. He didn't know a, a word of English, wow. which is super, you know, inspiring, obviously. Um, but he got on a motorcycle um, which he loved doing at the time, he got a crazy ticket that he had no idea how he was going to pay for. So he looked for any job at the time. He was able to actually get a job as a property manager. I think it was in downtown LA. Um, and was it, was it pretty tough back then too? Yes, very tough. 
So his boss at the time, and he tells the story way better than me, you know, as he was working in property management said, help us, you know, acquire a site. Um, and he said, I don't know how to do this. Like, you know, it's way harder. It was way harder back then there, than it is now with, you know, everything. Because we have computers on. now, right? With everything, right? He was like, how do I do this? How do I do this? <laughs> but he's honestly the smartest person I've ever met. He um, found a building. He presented it to his boss and a few guys. And they were like, all right, we'll buy it. And he was like, okay, real estate is amazing. Like, this is so cool. So, you know, he ended up going back to Israel. He got involved in real estate. And that's, you know, that's the short story. So, Danielle, um, like your day-to-day -day schedule, how does, that, how does that look for you? Like a Monday through Friday. I know you get to the office early and you stay late. As, as you are showing us right now, Danielle is still in the office. What time is it? It's late. You got to go home, girl. Um, my day-to-day, -day, honestly, it really varies because... As the real estate cycle and as we develop our projects, it's always changing, right? Like every project is in a different phase. So every project I'm working on something else. Sometimes we're in pre-development. Sometimes we're, you know, working on the construction of launching a sales gallery or we're already launched. There's, and we're continuing, you know, our initiative in sales and strategy. And then we also have our rental portfolio. So no day is the same, but honestly, that's what I, I really like about the job. And I think, you know, one of the, one of the things that is really, and, and what I love about real estate is we are constantly problem solving, no matter what it is. And it's, it's a lot of hard work and takes a lot of brain power from multiple people. This is not a job that you can figure out on your own. It's a collaborative effort, um, but it's solving problems every day, regardless of what we're doing. So um, I guess the top uh, the question that you just made me bring up, like prob problem solving, like, you know, every day. One thought that I've had, I mean, when I've seen, uh, you know, enormous buildings being built, I've seen like cranes going up, you know, like 50, 70 stories, whatever. What's the most dramatic thing that's happened um, in one of your buildings that like you thought that the, the deal was going to be over? You know what I mean? Like a crane falling, a construction yeah, worker okay, getting honestly, hurt. Do you have wood next to you? Do I have wood next to me? Yeah, do you have wood next to you? I mean, on my floor. So be right, beneath my feet. Not on my floor, because I'm going to do it also. Nothing has happened like that. So hopefully it stays that way. We nothing not yet? Yeah, of course. Nothing so nothing, nothing so what's, the, what's the, um, the biggest problem you've ever had to solve since working um, at Naftali Group? The biggest problem I've had to solve? Sure. That's whether, it's buy, whether it's buying out tenants, because you need to gut the whole building, whether it's talking to a bunch of owners, like those four owners of those buildings that you had to. I don't know. Reverse. You're really putting me on the spot. I don't. Yeah. I, they're all they're all tough. I don't know. Let's come back to this question. Okay, let's come back to this. I do have a question about how you deal with uh, the male presence in real estate. You know, like as you know, I'm sure, like whenever you go to meet and greets or wherever you go, whenever you go to. Yeah. Um, what, whatever the event is, it's definitely right. male oriented. So yeah. how do you kind of deal with men so much? Like we're not so great, especially. Yeah, so I've been asked this question many times. The good thing is, um, you know, our company, at least at Naftali Group, we're 50, 50. So half of our employees are male and half are female. Um, and I think that we have always had the mindset here that regardless of your gender, if you produce for the company, you will be successful. Um, I do think that, you know, women do have to work harder to prove themselves initially. For sure. Um, I agree. In, not just in real estate, though, in most industries, but I do think that once you do prove yourself, it is totally badass to be a girl boss. So I, I think that the good thing is in 2020, um, the doors have opened you know, for women a lot more than it used to be. And, you know, you do have to work a little bit harder, but you have the platform and you have the opportunity now. So if you work hard, I think you could be in any position that you want to be. in. Right. Well said. So you uh, mentioned, or I guess I mentioned that you do have other buildings outside of Manhattan, potentially in a Brooklyn, we don't fully know, but do you guys, are you guys planning on, moving to some of the red states where the real estate laws are a little bit more lax. You know, I've heard 
uh, I guess from a, no a number of people who work in the real estate industry that you can't make money in New York anymore, but you guys are obviously proving them wrong. So would you guys ever consider leaving New York City and building? Well, I, mean, I think the first thing is, you know, you have to look at the long-term play. It's not just about, you know, these next few months, because obviously we're, we're in a down market as an overall um, in real estate in New York. Obviously, the Benson is, is proving, you know, in, in, in a niche market. It's not for the entire New York yeah. um, city. But I will tell you just historically, um, my dad has done a lot of projects outside of Manhattan and also in Brooklyn. And, you know, I didn't want to tell you about our new project, but we do have a, um, a, a nice portfolio in Brooklyn of multifamily properties. Um, we've done a lot about, you know, projects outside of New York, both condo and, and um, income producing properties. And we are always looking for new opportunities. Okay, talking about all these buildings, Danielle, what is, what is next for you? When are you taking over the reins? When's your pops going to retire? When's it going to be Danielle Naftali Group? First of all, it's never going to be Danielle Naftali. It will always be Naftali Group. And, you know, my sister is actually in law school right now. Um, you know, she is super smart and she has other skill sets that, you know, I think will be super helpful for the company in a few years. Um, we have to let her do her studying for right now, but I, I, I think that she will end up here in the long run. Um, there is absolutely no way I'm letting my dad retire anytime soon. <laughs> and I think that the one thing that's, and I know I briefly mentioned it in the beginning of the, you know, um, podcast here is that real estate is, is really an industry that you don't learn overnight. And I've learned that, you know, after, like I said, six years being here, I think there's always more to learn. And I still, I know a lot, but there's still a lot for me to learn. And, you know, there's people at this company that, you know, have been here for much longer than I have. And um, I, I want my dad to stay here for as long as he can. And I'm not pushing him away in any way. Um, but instead, actually, what I'm doing is taking every minute that I have with him to learn as much as I can from him and everyone else at the company. Um, and that's really the goal right now to work as a team. It will never be just, you know, my show. You know, it's such an interesting, interesting thing you said, interesting, you know, topic you bring up in terms of like just learning from your dad just by picking his brain every day. And I feel like maybe more now. So people are starting to realize, oh, MBAs might not be worth it. My law degree might not be worth it. Going to medical school might not be worth it. Uh, although, you know, to be a practicing lawyer and to be a practicing doctor, you need to go to those two yes. schools. But every other kind of profession just seems like getting into the mix and just doing it is way better than school. You know what I mean? Like, I, if I went to get an MBA in like real estate, there's no way I'd be focusing six hours a day, taking notes, like listening to the professor, looking up at the blackboard, looking down, looking up and down. I think it's just a matter of, you know, getting into it. Do you guys manage everything? Hold on, I just want to say something okay. about that because I don't know if you remember, I know we've been friends for many years, but um, I decided three and a half years ago that I love my job. I love everything about it. I learned so much here on day to day. And you are right that you learn more, you know, being involved rather than sitting, you know, in a classroom. But I decided um, three and a half years ago that I was going to get my MBA because there's a lot of things that I learned here, but there's specific things about, you know, the finance and underwriting and things that someone on my team doesn't have time to teach me. So because I didn't want to give up my current position and I knew how much I learn in my position, I decided to get my MBA at NYU at night. So I was working a full-time job and then basically I would leave work around six o'clock. I would walk to NYU and I would leave at 1030. So for two and a half years, um, I was going to school every night. Night got school. Masters. What? Like night school. Night school. I was going to night school and I could only do my homework during the weekend. So I was working seven days a week. I graduated in May. But I will tell you that, you know, I think that many people, like you're saying in the family business, say, you know what? I'm already in the business. Like, what am I going to school for? But I learned a lot going to NYU and I met a lot of good people. And what was super, um, you know, informational, at least to me, was I learned from a lot of other people that were in other big companies. And I could come back here and say, oh, listen, this company is doing it this way. Why don't we try it? And I was able to bring 
new ideas to the company instead of just being in this box. And um, I, I would recommend that to people. I think that, you know, I, I met a lot of great people, you know, networking is huge in this business and, you know, you can do both. It, I didn't have a life, but I was able to do it. And, you know, I did it before I was married or with kids or anything like that. Which you're neither, correct? Exactly. Right. Exactly. So, um, so like, that's like, you, I, who knew you were working that hard? Well, now everybody listening and watching does. Yeah. Yeah, So, exactly. okay, so what I was um, about to ask before, um, which I'm sure is a question that a ton of people would have, you know, just living in an apartment. Do you guys do all of your management in-house or do you hire... Uh, another company to hire the superintendents to do the cleaning and all of that. So property management, we do not have in-house because our multifamily <clears throat> portfolio is quite small. And in order to bring property management in-house. Well, how, how small, how small yeah. is quite small, Daniel? No, only 300 units. Okay. That's not that big. That's a, that's but, a lot of units, but go ahead. So it is relatively small to make financial sense in terms of bringing property management in-house, but one of my secret projects that I can't tell you about oh, okay. um, is, going bring, <laughs> is going to bring our rental portfolio much larger than it currently is. And probably at that time, we would bring it in house. Now, when you're saying this is a secret, are you analyzing a deal that could potentially add on a number of units to your portfolio? We, we are already um, designing this project that I'm talking about. Now, I have a question. People, when they move out of Manhattan and they want to stay in New York City, I suppose, will move to, I don't know, a Sunnyside, Queens, maybe a Williamsburg, Brooklyn, Bushwick, Brooklyn. Would you guys, as yourselves, uh, ever consider building in like a Jersey City? I feel like people are always considering they want to go, uh, which, which way is Brooklyn? Is Brooklyn West or East? Teddy, Brooklyn. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to embarrass Brooklyn's you East. right now. First of all, we can definitely and, and New Jer and New Jersey's west. So go ahead and go ahead, please embarrass me. We would, we like I said, we are considering any opportunities that make sense. You sent me a deal in Jersey City that was just a little bit overpriced. But when was this? Oh, this was a couple of years ago. Yeah, exactly. Right, I remember well, that. Well, if you uh, you know want to do that deal and bring down your price, let's do it. <laughs> Danielle just making deals on the podcast. What's what's the, been the best day of your real estate career besides getting the um the uh, the Jerry Seinfeld article on the Benson? And hey, honestly, I I felt I have to say that I felt relieved and extremely extremely accomplished when I graduated from NYU because two and a half years of working seven days a week till ten thirty eleven at night, it was it was a lot, and I feel you know, very happy. And, and now I'm, you know, the great thing is I'm using all these skills that I learned at NYU and all these people I met and I'm implementing it into my day to day. And I would say that was my most positive accomplishment, um, doing both things at once, if you would agree. No, I totally agree. I totally agree, Danielle. You are a boss. You are a <laughs> boss. Danielle Naftali, thank you so much for joining the Ted Jones World Podcast. Everybody, Danielle Naftali, Google this girl. Or check out her Instagram, real deal. But your your IG was popping this week. I saw I a lot of a lot of um story reposts. I know. Did you see Jerry posted it? No, Jer I didn't see Jerry posted Jerry it. Jerry and his wife posted it. Jerry has a, Jerry Seinfeld has an Instagram. Yeah, go follow it. Yeah, who knows? Literally everyone. Danielle, can you please shout out your Instagram so people can people can follow you? Sure, at Danielle Naftali. <laughs> Beautiful. Danielle, thank you so much. And um, we're looking forward to seeing what other projects you uh, will come up next. Everybody check out the Benson on 79th and Madison. It is You're a very cool building. Danielle, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Bye.